Good day to everybody and welcome to this uh, ISDE online session entitled Controversies in Gastroesophageal Reflux Disease. I'm Jan Tak, I'm a gastroenterologist at Leuven University in Belgium. And um, it's my pleasure to co-chair this program together with Dr. Kerry Dunbar um, from University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. We have a um, top uh, speaker panel actually collected for you uh, to address this very important topic. I mean, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the PPIs were emerging and many of us believed that this was the end of the difficulties dealing with reflux disease. We now know that this was really a misconception and to date refractory and difficult to manage reflux disease is still an important clinical challenge. And this will be addressed and some new ways out of this uh, conundrum will be showed by the panel. So it's my pleasure to announce the first speaker, Kerry Dun Dunbar, who's, who will speak about long-term PPI therapy. She is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and the gastroenterology section chief of the VI, VA North Texas Healthcare System in Dallas, Texas. She graduated from Southwestern Medical School and completed her internal medicine and GI fellowship at Johns Hopkins Hospital in uh, Baltimore. In Baltimore, she was an assistant chief of service and she completed the PhD in clinical investigation at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And she is now an associate program director for the University of Texas Southwestern Internal Medicine Residency Program. Her clinical and research interests are amongst uh, others, gastroesophageal reflux disease, Barrett's esophagus, eosinophilic esophagitis and esophageal dysmotility. And she will talk about the risks and benefits of long-term PPI therapy. Carrie, over to you. Thank you. I'm happy to join you today uh, to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is proton pump inhibitors. Okay, so hopefully you can see my slides now. Of course, uh, mm -hmm. Zoom, we gotta love 2020. Um, I'm happy to speak with you today about one of my favorite topics, which is uh, PPI therapy, uh, in particular, long-term PPI therapy, because this is something that we all get asked about from our patients, uh, family members, and kind of what, what should our patients be doing? Um, as we all know, the gastroesophageal reflux disease is so common. The worldwide prevalence of weekly GERD symptoms is about 13%. Uh, that ranges from about 10% to 30%, depending on where you live. Uh, heartburn is more common in some countries than others. In the United States, it's about 20%. So one in five of our patients or people in the US have heartburn every single week. Since the 1990s, the prevalence of weekly GERD has, symptoms has increased about 50%. Um, this is worldwide. Uh, in this image with uh, of the world, the countries that are in red have a prevalence of weekly GERD of over 25%. Those that are orange are about 20 to 24%, yellow, like the United States, between 15 and 19%. So very common. Um, there's a number of reasons that things have, that GERD has increased, probably related to diet and the increasing uh, prevalence of obesity worldwide. Uh, we know that PPIs are very effective treatment for GERD. Before we have proton pump inhibitors, we had the uh, histamine 2 receptor antagonists and we've had antacids. Uh, but compared to the H2RAs and antacids, uh, PPIs are more effective for healing erosive esophagitis and controlling GERD symptoms. Uh, this image over on the right, or the graph over on the right, is actually from a meta-analysis looking at comparing PPIs and H2 receptor antagonists for healing erosive esophagitis. And you can see that the PPIs actually heal esophagitis much more successfully um, at about 80% after about eight weeks compared to the H2 receptor antagonists, uh, which about 40% of patients were healed. Um, proton pump inhibitors in the United States are approved for treatment of GERD, healing of erosive esophagitis, and maintenance of healed erosive esophagitis. Interestingly, they are actually approved for daily dosing for treatment of all of these conditions but what we see is that often patients need it twice a day. So in twice, they get used twice a day in clinical practice. So when should we be using PPIs to treat GERD? Uh, for patients with mild intermittent symptoms, such as patients who have 
uh, you know, one or one or twice, once or twice a week, have a little bit of heartburn, like if they go out and drink a bunch of beer and eat pizza. Um, these patients can often get by using an antacid or an H2 receptor antagonist as needed. Uh, for patients who are not having a response, then you want to consider escalating therapy. For moderate symptoms of PPI uh, heartburn, uh, we typically give people eight weeks of a daily H2 receptor antagonist or PPI. If there's a partial response, you can consider escalating therapy. And if there's no response to PPIs, uh, you want to consider testing, uh, such as endoscopy or uh, pH testing. Uh, for patients with a re severe symptoms or erosive esophagitis, I generally start these folks on eight weeks of daily PPI. Uh, if there's no response, then I want to think about testing. In some cases, if they have a partial response, so they're having some improvement of their heartburn with PPI therapy, but it's just not complete relief, you can think about doing a twice daily PPI dose before breakfast and dinner. Uh, regardless of the regimen that you, the patient it's working on, if you're successful, you wanna make sure you're using the lowest effective dose to control the heartburn symptoms. And one important thing to remember is that all of our patients uh, need diet and lifestyle counseling about what to eat, how to eat, when to take their medications and other things that they can do to help improve their heartburn symptoms. So now we've talked a little bit about when you should use PPIs. So how are PPIs really used? Um, and this is my, my favorite PPI cartoon. I know they, the, the woman has cooked dinner. I know that lasagna gives you heartburn and so she makes some PPIs into it. Uh, so we know that um, PPI use is very common. In the United States where we use a lot of medicines for everything, about 7% of the US population is taking prescription PPIs. Uh, we spend $14 billion a year on proton pump inhibitors, uh, and they are one of the most commonly uh, prescribed medications worldwide. And we know that PPIs are overused. Um, there have been a lot of studies that have looking at the, looked at this, and in one large study of 168,000 outpatient adults with PPI prescriptions, 39% lacked an appropriate diagnosis that would require PPI therapy. So there's a lot of overuse of PPIs. So, um, which brings us to kind of the, the bigger discussion today, which is what about risk and PPIs? You know, what do you say when your patients, parents, and neighbors are asking you questions about whether their medications are safe and whether they should take them? So there have been many, many studies uh, looking at proton pump inhibitor therapy and the risk of a number of different diseases. You can see that uh, from this cartoon between the brain, the heart, uh, the kidneys, um, pretty much every organ system in the body, there's been a paper about PPI use and how it might have an effect. Um, and there are studies that are reported all the time. Uh, so, you know, but many of these are observational studies, which we'll talk more about in a minute. So I wanted to start first with what we have as far as randomized controlled trial data for the adverse effects related to PPI treatment. And there's been one kind of big study looking at this. There was a randomized controlled trial of PPI safety in patients taking rivaroxaban or aspirin. This is the COMPASS trial. Uh, there, this trial was very large. It took 17,000, more than 17,000 patients. The majority of them were over the age of 65, or if they were younger and had uh, multi-vessel uh, vascular disease or other risk factors. Um, they took patients with cardiovascular or peripheral artery disease um, and did a three by two factorial randomization to look at a number of different things. So the thing that as GI doctors, we're probably most interested in is the patients are randomized to pantoprazole 40 milligrams a day or placebo. They also, as part of the three by two factorial randomization were placed on a combination of rivaroxaban and aspirin, rivaroxaban alone or aspirin alone with the pantoprazole or placebo PPI. Um, the patients were excluded from the study if they really already knew they needed long-term PPI therapies or they wouldn't stop taking their PPI or H2 receptor antagonist. In this study, they uh, assessed outcomes every six months to see what happened with the patients over the next few years. And they had um, a list of pre-specified things that they were looking for. So they wanted to look at the rates of cardiovascular events and also look at the PPI adverse events. And in particular, they you know, looked at all the other observational research studies and identified what are the common adverse events that people are reporting and what are people concerned about? And they specifically looked for those. So looking at the outcomes, comparing patients who got PPI versus placebo, 
There was no difference in cardiovascular mortality, myocardial infarction, or stroke. And this is uh, one of the graphs from the study, which shows the cumulative incidence risk of cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke. Um, and essentially those lines comparing pantoprazole to placebo and those lines essentially overlap. There's no difference in risk. There is also no difference in this study in the rates of pneumonia, fractures, chronic kidney disease, dementia, cancer, or gastric atrophy. They did find more infections with proton pump inhibitor use, in particular enteric infections, so diarrhea, um, with a rate of 1.4% versus 1% and an odds ratio of about 1.3. Um, in this particular study, Clostridium difficile infections were rare, but they were more common in the PPI group. There were nine in the PPI group compared to four, but there was no statistically significant difference. So that, um, so when we are looking, so that's one of the, the one big randomized control trial about PPI risk. So there, we have a lot of other observational studies. Um, most of them are case controller cohort studies, which you can get valuable information about risk from these, but there are a few things that you need to think about when you're looking at these studies. Um, observational studies typically examine the association between PPIs and disease X uh, with questions to ask. Um, when you're looking at these, is there a biological explanation? How strong is the association between proton pump PPIs and disease X? Is there a dose duration effect? Is the association between PPIs and disease X consistent? Do you see it in more than one research study? And it, something else to think about is there's something called the zone of potential bias. So if you have an odds ratio that's between 0.3 and about three or four or a relative risk of two to three, that is not as convincing as something with a very high odds ratio or relative risk. And often these, um, the association is not as strong. So let's look at a couple of common adverse events that are reported with PPIs and kind of look at the evidence behind these. So uh, first of all, we wanna look at the biological explanation um, for PPI, the association between PPIs and diarrhea. We know that gastric acid kills bacteria, PPIs affect the gut microbiome, uh, and thus maybe you have fewer bacteria killed in the stomach. Um, the risk of bacterial gastroenteritis, such as salmonella and campylobacter with PPI use, when we look at um, a number of studies, the odds ratio is about 3.3, which is a moderate association. There's a moderate level of evidence and the association has been consistent across several studies. Um, when you look at Clostridium difficile and PPI use, uh, with PPI use, there's in an increased risk of Clostridium difficile diarrhea and with an odds ratio of about 1.99, so which falls into that kind of weaker association. The risk with antibiotic Use and PPI increases the risk. And of course, if you've had C. diff before, being on PPIs increases the risk even a little bit further. There's a moderate amount of evidence suggesting that this is a real risk and it's consistent across number, a number of meta-analyses. So kidney disease is another uh, topic that patients will ask about and it's something that we need to think about with PPI use. Um, the biological explanation for how PPIs would affect kidney disease uh, is that that can cause repeated episodes of acute interstitial nephritis. It's rare and patients may not have many symptoms. Recurrent episodes of acute interstitial nephritis can lead to chronic kidney disease. In one giant cohort study of almost 300,000 older adults, AIN was more common in PPI users compared to non-users with a hazard ratio of three, so a moderate association. Looking at another giant study of almost half a million adults, the odds ratio for AIN with PPI use was about five. So again, a moderate association. The incidence rates for AIN uh, with current use of PPIs was about almost 12 and with past use of PPIs was about 1.6. So this actually shows that there's a dose and duration effect. So current use, risk is higher. Former use, the risk is uh, lower again. So there is evidence for an association between AIN and PPIs. It's moderate and consistent. So uh, if we look at PPIs and bone fractures, um, there's a biological ex explanation for why this might happen, that PPIs can reduce absorption of calcium, which can lead to osteoporosis and fractures. Um, there's also some suggestions that PPIs have effects on osteoclasts and other thing, um, osteoblasts related to bone formation. There are some studies that show a dose duration effect where it appears to be, the risk appears to be higher with longer use and higher doses. Uh, and in a meta, a one big meta-analysis of 10 studies and 230,000 fracture patients, 
There was a moderate increase in the risk of hip and spine fractures of PPI use with a risk ratio of 1.25, which falls into that weak association category. In this particular meta-analysis, there were six studies that showed an increased risk with P of fractures with PPI use. Two studies showed no difference, and two studies showed that PPIs protect against fracture. So this, uh, isn't, this association is not consistent across studies. So one of those six questions we were looking at at the beginning. So when you look at the pneumonia data, we have um, the biological explanation for this is that gastric acid should kill bacteria in the stomach. And so PPIs allow bacteria to grow in the stomach and then thus leading to pneumonia um, as patients cough or regurgitate. Uh, there is our, in one study looking at community acquired pneumonia PPI use, um, meta-analyses of a bunch of observational studies, the risk of community acquired pneumonia on patients with PPI had an odds ratio of 1.2. Um, compared to H2 receptor antagonists where the odds ratio of getting pneumonia was 1.22. So those are low and the evidence is fairly weak and there's not a significant difference between PPIs and the H2 receptor antagonists. In a second meta-analysis um, of five recent studies of community-acquired pneumonia, the association between PPIs and pneumonia was seen in one study, but not in four other studies. So overall, the association is weak and not consistent. So, uh, which brings us to our main, you know, 2020, uh, we've had a lot of focus on understandably COVID-19. Um, there have been a number of studies that have started looking at PPI use and the risk of COVID-19. So the biological explanation for why these might be related is that PPIs affect gastric acid, allowing SARS-CoV-2 to reach the bowel, um, causing infection um, and symptoms from there. So there are one big study was an online survey with 53,000 participants, about 6.4% of uh, people who answered the survey had reported a positive COVID-19 test. Um, and when they looked at other health factors for these participants compared to no PPI use, PPI use is associated with the odds of, of reporting a positive COVID-19 test. Uh, for patients who used up to a daily PPI, the adjusted odds ratio was two. For twice daily PPI, the adjusted odds ratio was about 3.6, and there appeared to be no increased risk from an H2 receptor antagonist. There have been a lot of questions uh, and letters to the editor about the study. It's very interesting. Uh, it would be nice to have additional data. There is some, uh, there are other studies that are ongoing, and one that was recently published in GUT was a nationwide cohort study in South Korea with propensity score matching, which helps try and match up groups that you're comparing. Um, in a study. So PPI use did not increase the risk of having a SARS-CoV-2 test that was positive, but for, but for patients who actually developed a COVID-19 infection, the adjusted odds ratio of having severe disease was a little, was higher. It was 1.79. So not a very strong association, but they're, um, you know, the jury is still out. We'll have to see. We need some more data to see how really PPIs uh, affect the risk of getting a coronavirus infection and having outcomes, a bad outcome. So what do we do now? Um, we have new PPI studies that are published every month. Uh, and what if some of these risks are real? Because right now, you know, it looks like diarrhea is definitely, and C. diff are definitely at risk. A coronavirus, we don't know. And then some of the other, as studies are published on fracture and pneumonia and all of these other topics, you know, our data may change. So what if some of these are real? Um, there are a number of issues to consider when you're looking at observational studies. Uh, one thing to remember is that correlation is not equal to causation. Uh, one of my favorite graphs that illustrates this is this one at the bottom, which looks at the per capita consumption of margarine, and so butter substitute, and the divorce rate in Maine, which is one of the states in the United States. So between the years of 2000 and 2009, you can see that these two uh, graphs, almost these two lines on this graph almost overlap. And so that as margarine consumption decreased, so did the divorce rate. Now, these we know in real life, there's no biological plausibility for this. There's no reason that these things should be associated, but this is something that you can find with statistical analysis when you're doing an observational study. So other issues to consider, um, there is something called protopathic bias or reverse causality, which occurs when the PPI is started in response to the first symptoms of the disease, which is undiagnosed at this time. So for example, if we have a gentleman who's having abdominal pain and goes to the doctor uh, and it's indigestion, so he's prescribed a PPI. 
it doesn't get better and a month later has an endoscopy and it turns out he has gastric cancer. So do we think that the PPI caused the gastric cancer? Well, no, the gastric cancer was already there. He was just treated with a PPI to try and treat the symptoms of indigestion without knowing that there was a cancer there. However, if I was doing an observational research study where I had a snapshot in time, all I would know is that the patient was on a PPI and had gastric cancer and might incorrectly assume that these things are linked. Uh, the other thing to consider is that a lot of the observational studies, you know, in research studies assume that all patients are the same and that PPI use is the only difference. But if you think about it, my patients who need PPI really are not the same as the patients who need an H2 receptor antagonist for controlling their GERD. And this is, uh, there's something called residual confounding that can enter into these studies where even if you try and match your groups of patients by age and gender um, and other health issues, there may be still unknown factors affecting the outcome. So, um, so when we're looking at risk uh, with PPIs, there are lots of different terms that we can use to describe risk. There's odds ratios, relative risk, and hazard ratios. And depending how you report this information, the numbers can look very scary. So for example, if we take an example from a study of PPIs and chronic kidney disease, chronic kidney disease was more uncommon in patients with PPI users uh, who were using PPI with a hazard ratio of about 1.5. If I was trying to write a scary newspaper headline, uh, I would say that there was a 50% increase in kidney disease in PPI users. However, in this study, the authors actually calculated the 10-year absolute risk difference for chronic kidney disease between PPI use and non-PPI use, and it was 3.3%. So, so what that means is that for a patient who uses PPIs for 10 years, the risk difference for getting chronic kidney disease is only 3.3% higher. So uh, that is a much more realistic assessment of the risk of chronic kidney disease with PPI use than saying, oh, there's a 50% increase. Um, so I would encourage you to look for papers that, have, that talk about the absolute risk difference and over what period of time is the risk. So um, what should we do with our patients who have GERD and who are on PPIs? Because we have a lot of known risks and then some unknown risks and we'll have to see. Um, it's important to encourage healthy diet and lifestyle changes such as smoking cessation and weight loss uh, and not eating meals late at night um, and uh, staying, if possible, staying away from fast food, which is very common in Texas where I live. People eat a lot of fast food uh, because those diet and lifestyle changes can really help control the GERD symptoms. We want to use the lowest dose that works um, for controlling GERD. Some of the studies show that there's a dose response and duration effect with PPI adverse events. So if your patient can have their symptoms controlled on a daily PPI, that's certainly better than leaving them, than leaving them on a twice daily PPI for, you know, forever. Um, it's also important to revisit PPI dosing periodically. You know, have the patient's symptoms improved? Have they actually been able to make the diet and lifestyle changes or lose a little bit of weight and maybe their symptoms are better? And it's also important to confirm that the PPIs are taken properly because they're much more effective when they're dosed at the right time, and that which is 30 to 60 minutes before a meal. And then, you know, it, it's important to think about well, can we decrease the dose for any of our patients? Um, our neighbors to the north in Canada actually have a program called Bye Bye PPI, and you could it's at deprescribing.org. You can find this on the internet, and they actually have a whole system for deciding how who should be on a PPI and whether somebody can be deprescribed. Um, so, you know, first reason, the thing they look at is why is the patient taking a PPI? You know, do you know or do you not know? Um, if there's some indications such as uh, chronic NSAID use with bleeding risk and patients with Barrett's esophagus where they say, okay, continue a PPI. And for the patients with mild to moderate GERD or some of the other indications like stress ulcer prophylaxis in the ICU um, or unexplained GI symptoms, they talk about how to deprescribe you know, whether it's stopping completely or stepping down the dose, uh, and then when to monitor the patient. So it's not that you just stop and it's like, see ya, or, you know, don't come back. It's, you know, you check in with them at four weeks and at 12 weeks, and then determine whether they need to go back on the PPI or do something different. So this is a, a useful algorithm if you want to try and decrease PPI use for some of your patients. So what do I tell my patients? Because they do, I get questions and the people, you know, our patients read the newspaper, so they see the articles, and there's a lot of risk. Um, and I get questions from our primary care physicians also. 
So what do I tell my patients? So if they have concerns about long-term PPIs, we talk through them and talk about, you know, what are the known risks um, and what we can do about them. Also, it's important to make, help them understand that like not all risk is the same. Um, and remember that statistical correlation does not equal causation. And it's also important to try and give our patients a sense of the absolute excess risk, that not every single person who takes a PPI breaks a bone, gets kidney disease, dementia, and diarrhea. Um, and, you know, and that some of these risks are low and over the long term, but then to try and, you know, keep their symptoms controlled on the minimum amount of dose. Uh, so we need to be smart about our PPI use um, to protect our patients and hopefully keep their heartburn and uh, under control and keep them from having long-term sequelae of GERD. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, um, Kerry. Um, there's a few questions. The first one is you, you addressed the study with uh, rivaroxaban and with aspirin. However, I think in the past, most of the issues raised were with clopidogrel. Can we still say that uh, there is any interaction of PPI and Plavix or cl clopidogrel? Is it contraindicated? Should clinicians take any measure? So there have been a lot of papers looking at uh, PPIs and clopidogrel. Um, they, uh, including randomized control trials and meta-analyses. One of the interesting, thing, interesting things about the clopidogrel and PPI use is when you look at observational data, there appears to be a risk. But the number, uh, there were a number of randomized control trials where you, know, you have a better balance of patients in each of the groups. Um, and those did not show uh, much of a link between PPI use and uh, clopidogrel and bad outcomes. So certainly, you know, work with your cardiologist, but I think they're probably safe to use. And there's also been some suggestions that you can change to a different PPI and then, and then that would help. That said, most of our cardiologists here are happy to have their patients not bleed, um, and, you know, particularly if they've already had bleeding and we keep them on their PPIs. Okay. Very good. Then another question is, um, um, is there any association between PPIs and esophageal adenocarcinoma? I think this is a long lingering issue as well. Um, so, all right. So association of PPIs and adenocarcinoma. So uh, some of the issues with these studies, it goes back to the like patients are taking them, but then they also have another risk factor for adenocarcinoma. That's probably actually what's driving the risk. And so it's not the PPIs causing the risk. There's actually some uh, nice data from the speckler Souza research group um, who I've collaborated with that they, uh, PPIs actually have um, some effects that may prevent adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. And we've got lots of observational data and now even some randomized controlled trial data that shows that PPIs prevent progression to esophageal adenocarcinoma in Barrett's esophagus. So there's some biological plausibility. There are basic science studies that suggest that. And now we have um, the ASPECT trial that had aspirin and PPI use looking to try and prevent progression to high-grade dysplasia and cancer. And it was, seems to work. So. Okay, very good. One last small question before we move on with the program. Some of the European participants are slightly unhappy indicating we don't have H2 blockers anymore. And it's true, they have been taken off market because of a manufacturing issue and they've never been replaced. And you gave a place to H2 blockers either for intermittent use or for down tapering of PPIs. Do you think we could use an alginator or a mucosal coating agent based on, um, on chondroitin sulfate, for instance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. We have only lost one of our, our H2 receptor antagonists uh, in the US. We don't really have much ranitidine anymore, but it is a problem. Uh, I am very jealous, though, that you guys have real alginates in Europe. And the uh, so the coating effect of the alginates, um, where it creates kind of a raft on top of the acid pocket, I think those actually work very well. There's actually nice randomized controlled trial data that shows it works for primary treatment of mild to moderate GERD, as well as uh, as add-on therapy for patients who are on PPIs and still having persistent symptoms. So I wish we had those here because I think that would be very beneficial. Um, but yeah, it's there are also some nice studies that show some patients can get by with intermittent PPI use. It's not really how they're intended to be. 
used, but that's another option if you're trying to minimize use, but still cut your patient kind of needs a PPI. So that's another okay. option. Excellent. I think this was a great start and I'll be happy to hand over to you to announce our second speaker.